or you can bring me the old book and uh, you know get rid of it and give it to me anytime you like. Uh, we won't be using it again, you know, unless you want to keep it until we're testing. Just uh, put it on the shelf there, and I'll mark you off there. Thank you. So yeah, if you brought it, just go ahead and put it on the shelf, and and I'll mark you off. Um, so we don't take time doing all that. And if you didn't bring it today, just bring it uh, when you think of it and leave it off with me. And if you forget, then I'll just, you know, put the fine down there. We'll never get your diploma. Questions from the homework? Any of those you'd like to be clarified? <laughs> Yes, um, great. Um, can you do uh, my homework times two is ninety eight seventy? Do you know what that means? Or is that not there? Um, it's the limit at x that can put both two and two and one. Natural log x or total log. Oh, this is really a, kind of a tricky one here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we want to do here is let's do because uh, if we just let x go to infinity, we're getting infinity over infinity, which is indeterminate, and we don't know Lopi Powell's rule or whatever that thing is. So that's not an option at this point. So instead, what we want to do is uh, do a change of base, and so we want to make these be logarithms with the same base. And so you can kind of choose either way you want to go. If you want to change the natural logarithm to a common log or the common log to a natural log. And since we're calculus students, we're kind of partial anymore to natural logarithm. So we would like to convert all of the world to a natural logarithm. So to do that, we'll think of this uh, log base 10 of x, which is what our common logarithm is. And do you remember the change of base, or do you want to see where it comes from? If you don't remember, you can recreate it easily enough. So you just set it equal to y. Okay, and then you can write the corresponding exponential. So we can say 10 to the y is equal to x. You with me there? Keep in mind that y is our logarithm base 10. That's our common log. Now we'll take the natural log. So we'll introduce the one we want. So we'll take the natural log of both sides. And then we can use our property of log norms and bring that y out in front. So we have y natural log 10 is natural log x. And then we're solving for the y, which remember was our common log. So we'll divide the natural log uh, the other side. And so we get the natural log x over natural log 10. And so remember our y was our common log over the log of x. So the, the change of base says, if you don't like the base you're in, just call it the base you want, and then divide by the logarithm of the new base of the old base. So we had log x, we just made it natural log x, and we kind of had this little adjustment factor that we're going to divide by the logarithm new base, the natural log, of the old base 10. So then we can come back here and say, well, that's natural log x over natural log 10. And then, you know, to divide by natural log x over natural log 10 is to multiply by the reciprocal. So we have our original natural log x. And now we have natural log 10 over natural log x. We can cancel the natural log x's. And so it's going to be the natural log of 10. That's our limit on that one. Way more fun than Lopi Powell's rule anyway. Good. That uh, will come back to you. Uh, well, we kind of did in a sense because we now limit as x goes to infinity. Since we've taken x out of the whole issue, we're still just going to be natural log 10. Anything else? So this is part of our, you know, we talked about this at the very beginning of the year. This is like our speed review. And you can see that we're going to kind of do pretty much two assignments a day. Hopefully they're shortened up a little bit because uh, I don't want to crush you if, you know, all you do all your life is math homework. But I want to do, so I 
you know, the point is kind of do, do enough problems to refresh and review your memory, you know, your, your recollection of that. Because we need to have those skills. 60% of the, of the BC exam is identical to the AB exam. So you will see all of the same things you did last year. Uh, and so usually on the, so typically, you know, last year was so weird, but, you know, usually two thirds of the multiple choice questions are identical. And then you'll get some that the AB kids won't see. And on the pre-response, it's usually, you know, there's six, usually six problems. Three of them are going to be shared with AB, and three will be different, that will be unique to BC. So you have to know this stuff, which is kind of good. In, it's good in the sense that, you know, seeing it again sometimes can add clarity to it. So I'm not going to go clear, obviously, in the depth that we did the first time around. So I'm going to try to hit the highlights. But if you, if we hit something that for you either was really tough the first time around and you didn't really get, or you just it's really become a blank spot because of the house cleaning you did over the summer and swept everything out, let me know because we can spend more time on what you need help on. And otherwise, I'll just kind of go over it pretty quickly and lightly. Occasionally in here, we will insert some topics that fit in with where we are, but are new to to be for, for BC. So they may be BC topics that, uh, you know, we didn't see last year because we were in AB, but they kind of fit thematically in where we are. So it won't be entirely reviewed. And then we have a different textbook. So you'll see a very different author's perspective on things. So it, I, hopefully the problems that you do aren't going to be like, oh man, I remember doing this problem. Because that'll be a different style and different flavor uh, because we have very different authors. So, that's my hope anyway. Okay. Yeah. On that note, is there a schedule for AB classes split if we wanted to, we could review their videos? Or would we just have to look at them? You know, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure how that works. Because um, they're all up on Canvas, but you guys can't get on their Canvas. I think you can access it through YouTube. That's what I was going to say, because it's all up on my YouTube channel. So I, it's not organized now, but supposedly the Mr. Moore, the tech guy, is going to help me organize them. I have no idea what it looks like, but I think you can see them all up there. And I think they're labeled anyway by, by topic. Yeah, so you're welcome. Yeah, I, that'd be great anytime. And then as we do those, I, I will create new videos for you also. They may not be quite as in depth, maybe, as some of those would be for an AB case. Good question. Anything else? Okay, so let's jump on to uh, continuity and the intermediate value theorem. So we, we build off of the idea of continuity at a point. So we'll talk about continuity at a point, and then once we understand what that means, then we can go on and talk about continuity on an open interval, continuity on a closed interval, and then we'll look at um, and some intermediate value theorem, which is a theorem about continuity. So uh, there are, uh, to be continuous, so we will say F is, continuous at x equals c if and only if there are three conditions that have to be satisfied. So these three things must be true for a function to be continuous at a point. If any one of the three are not satisfied, then the function is discontinuous. So uh, one is that the limit as x approaches c of f of x 
must exist. A limit must exist. When you talk about limits, I mean the limit can't go to infinity, can't be, you know, a left-hand limit different than right-hand limit, you can't have an oscillation. Secondly, f of c exists. So the function must be defined at that point. So you can't have a hole in the graph. It's not going to be continuous at that point. And the third thing is that those two have to agree that the limit as x approaches c of f of x must, in fact, be what the function is defined to be. So that eliminates that hole that's defined to be something else. So we see then that there are uh, three kinds of discontinuity. Three kinds of discontinuity. So one is uh, you could, I'm going to give you a visual here, and then I'll give you a name for it. So you could have just a hole in the graph, or you could have a hole where the function is defined to be something that does not fill in the hole. And both of those cases are known as, remember? Yeah, those are removable discontinuity. Uh, a second thing that can happen is you can get something that's more serious. So in a sense, the idea of a removable discontinuity is it's a it's like a minor infraction of this whole continuity thing because it could be fixed just by redefining the function at that one point. So if you just said, well, we're going to define this to be and then fill in the hole, it becomes continuous. And likewise here. Once you get to the other discontinuities, you can't fix it by just changing one point. If you had all of these points down here, not just the one. And what's this called? Jump. That's a jump. Discontinuity. It's still there. And then the other one, you know, when you have that vertical asymptote, whatever that may look like, then what kind of a discontinuity is that? Mm -hmm. Infinite. Yeah, an infinite discontinuity. So that's how we define continuity at a point. It's got to satisfy these three things. Sometimes people like to say this is like the shortcut or abbreviated version of uh, the definition of continuous, that if the limit is equal to the value of the function, it must be continuous there, because kind of implied in that is for these to be equal, they must both exist. They must be a number. So they can't be equal if they don't exist. So that's sometimes considered a short version of the definition of continuity. So anytime you're asked to justify your answer on a continuity question, you have to somehow communicate that you understand that the three conditions have been met. The limit exists, the function is defined, the limit is equal to the function. So uh, then uh, continuity on an open interval I don't think is too Earth shattering continuity on an open interval. And by open interval, I mean we don't include the endpoints. So we say F is continuous. F is continuous on the open interval from A comma B. So not including the endpoint. And if and only if F is continuous at each point in that interval from A to B. So all the individual point-wise continuities are, are there. So examples, you know, you see that something like, you know, polynomial is going to be continuous on the open interval from A to Infinity, so polynomials are continuous everywhere. So are exponentials. 
you can also say that uh, something like g of x is equal to the natural log of x is continuous where it's defined. So it will be continuous on the open interval from 0 to infinity. And I did not do for a blink there, so I'm not. Oof. This tree you can sleep with your eyes open. Okay. So there's continuity on an open interval. Continuity on a closed interval is, uh, is a little bit uh, trickier just because of our definition of continuity at a point. So if we have something like uh, f of x is equal to, say, the square root of 4 minus x squared, f of x equals the square root of 4 minus x squared, then with your finger in the air, you know what that looks like? Is that like your signature? It's a flourish. <laughs> it's a semicircle. I think we're getting some of those. So it's top half of a, set of a circle. So it's a semicircle there. Okay. You can kind of see it if you, you know, if you start with this and square both sides, you get y squared equals 4 minus x squared, add the x squared over it. So x squared plus y squared equals 4 is the whole circle centered at the origin, radius 2. And when you take y equals the square root of that, then that becomes the non-negative square root. So you get only the values where y is positive or 0. So you can see here that it certainly meets our eyeball uh, judgment on being continuous on the interval, the closed interval from negative 2 to 2. And it is. The, the issue is, you know, with our definition of continuity, we said that to be continuous at this endpoint, uh, the criteria for continuity is the, the limit has to exist, but a limit is two-sided, and this function isn't defined on the left side. So what is said, and I'm not going to write it all out, but I think it makes good sense. You say that it is continuous on the open interval from negative 2 to 2. So all the interior points meet that same criteria that it has to satisfy those three conditions to be continuous. And then you grant a special condition for the endpoints that instead of saying that the limit has to exist, you say, uh, I'm going to call this just in general from A to B, where A is the left endpoint and B is the right endpoint. And you say the limit as x approaches a from the right, so that left endpoint, of f of x is equal to f of a. So instead of insisting on a true two-sided limit, which this could never meet that criteria, because it's not defined over there to the left, you say, well, at least the limit as you come in from the one side where the function is defined is equal to that point. And likewise, for the right endpoint, you say the limit as x approaches b from the left of f of x must equal f of b. And then if that's the case, we include the endpoints and the function is continuous on the closed interval, which this is. So it does meet that criteria. And you know, you can do it's called half open or half closed. You know, if, if one side of the interval you include and you don't include the other, you know, something like g of x equals the square root of x, which we know is only defined for x greater than or equal to 0. So this will be continuous on the half open or half closed interval, including 0. And then you can never include infinity. So that works as well. Same ideas. The way you include the endpoint is that the, per, the appropriate one-sided limit is equal to the value of the function at that endpoint. So not first shattering, but mathematicians have to be very precise in their definitions and their language. And so we talk about that. So there's continuity rules. I guess I mean rules for continuity. Differentiability rules. But I guess I can just do all together. So one is that um, uh, if uh, f and G are continuous 
time, I'll say an interval where interval i, then so are the following. Sometimes these are nice to know, I think, because um, for peace of mind, I think as much as anything, it's annoying. Gosh, does this thing continuous or not? So any constant times a continuous function is still going to be continuous. So we know that uh, sine and cosine are continuous for all yields. And so, so would then whatever you want to multiply that by. So, so would uh, pi over 2 times sine x also be continuous. So it's just a constant times a continuous function. Uh, likewise, if f and g are continuous, so is their sum or difference. So, for example, sine of x plus cosine of x, because sine and cosine are each independently continuous everywhere, so is uh, sine of x plus cosine x going to be continuous everywhere. Um, product, so if you have, uh, if you have two continuous functions, then I'm sorry, it's fg of x is also going to be continuous. So if we say y is sine of x times cosine of x, since sine and cosine are each continuous, then so will sine times cosine. When you divide, what's the only thing you have to worry about? Dividing by zero. Yeah, you can't divide by zero. So we'll say, well, we're okay with f of x divided by g of x as long as that denominator function is not zero. And if it is, then it's continuous everywhere except at whatever values of x make that equal to zero. So we know that sine and cosine are both continuous. Tangent, which is sine over cosine, is going to be continuous everywhere except where cosine is equal to zero. And that's where tangent just goes vertical asymptotes. And kind of the most interesting one is that proposition f of g of x. So this will be continuous, uh, but now we just have to be, uh, we'll say at x equals c. So and remember now, so what we need is for g to be continuous at c, but then we also need, because now we've changed the input value for f, so it will be continuous at x equals c if f is continuous where? G of c. Yeah. If it's continuous at g of c, because that's what's going to be input into f. And there's some, uh, they have, i got to see if I can find them. There's some really tricky, deep thinking questions on these that uh, they have made available through AP. So I'll try to find some of those because I think there, there's a lot to be learned in just trying to sort through that whole proposition. Can you also do the definition of integral would be continuous? Um, yes, that is going to be true. Uh, that if a function is continuous, then it is certainly integrable. And its integral will be continuous as well. And we say that if a function is differentiable, then its derivative will be continuous. We don't necessarily know that the derivative will be also differentiable, but we still can get confirmation. That's actually, I think we'll see it clear in my uh, unit later. The harder questions. Okay. So let's talk about the intermediate values here. Of course, this is one of the big ones. So, the professor that once said, anytime it's got a name, it's important. And it's got a name and an abbreviation both. So, we'll refer to it affectionately as the IVT. So, it's a theorem about continuity. So, in uh, and, AP in the last so five years, maybe a little bit longer, they've really put an emphasis on knowing what are called the conditions of the major theorem. So, and the intermediate value theorem certainly qualifies as a major theorem in 
calculus. So it, it's important to know not only just what does it say, but but also emphasize what must be true before you can apply the integer value theorem. So theorems are written in if-then form. If something is true, blah, 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 those are called the conditions or sometimes the hypothesis, then the conclusion. So you have to know what those conditions are. What's the hypothesis? What must be true before you can make the conclusion that the theorem describes? Does that kind of make sense a little bit? Okay, so it says if f is continuous, Uh, on a closed interval, uh, which we will denote as a, b with the brackets, and f of a is less than or equal to a, which is less than or equal to f of b. And I put that f of a is smaller than f of b, but that doesn't necessarily have to be true, okay? So it could be that f of b is less than or equal to k is less than or equal to f of a. Uh, then, uh, let me say that, then there exists a c in that interval from a to b such that f of c is equal to k. So visually, I think it makes sense um, keeping track of the, the hypothesis or the conditions is important. So there's three of them. You know, you have that continuity piece. You have to have a closed interval. And then you've got this piece must be true. And I guess there's kind of, uh, well, that's the conclusion part after that. But the, it's still, it's not part of the hypothesis, but the C has to be in that interval. So, and it could be more than one. So you could get multiple values of C. But you just got to be careful that you don't claim something is a, is a solution or a guaranteed by the integer value theorem if it doesn't lie in the interval. Because then that's not true any longer. So if we have our, our just our generic function, something like that, we call that f of x. And then we've got a closed interval, so we've got a point over here that's A, and a point over here that's B. And reading across the Y values are F of A and F of B, somewhere over there. Then what the, the intermediate value claims is you pick any value in between F of A and F of B, then call that K, and the claim is there must be some value C in that interval from A to B that f of c is equal to that number k. And it comes from the whole continuity thing because you can't somehow skip over that point along the way because it's continuous. You can't miss any points along the way. So that's the idea behind it. Okay. So that's enough to get you to homework number 30 or 20, 23. Then we can talk about uh, 2.4 rates of change in the tangent lines. So hey, also make sure you're checking on uh, Canvas. There are now assignments up there from AP Classroom. And I think we got a very low percentage of participation on the first one there, like 23% or something. So you need to check with those. The, the intent on those is to try to get a quick check of your knowledge and understanding of a topic that was taught that day. And so I, I, my intent was to keep the window open fairly short, like, if there was one for today, it would be open for like 48 hours. I've extended them because I have gotten some people saying, I didn't do that one that was on there two weeks ago. So if that's one of you, let me know and I'll try to open up at 
I'm not going to do that every week. Wait, these are on Canvas? Yes. So you, you can access them on Canvas. They're out of AP Classroom. So when you, were the other ones? Uh, you have to look in Canvas. Yeah. Do you know when they were signed? So we were just talking about those. Um, there might be one might be one today because it's like continuity I think. Um, there's one on limits is it every day this week oh somebody that's actually looking at what's on there I appreciate that yeah I think you have one each, each day this week so I had a check with my idea my hope is that um, there's some multiple choice questions and I don't know if, I don't think most of them are actually some of them are actually from earlier AP exams, or I don't think they've allowed me to make those accessible outside of the class. So the ones that you will see, but they're very AP style, you'll see. They're very much written in the style of AP, but they'll be testing kind of just the, the knowledge of the topic that we just talked about. So they're very current and relevant. And so it'll give you some feedback because they, they're mobile choice. As soon as you finish, it tells you what you scored on it. And then if you don't understand something, because some of them are kind of tricky, bring it up in class and we'll talk about it. We can say, why was this correct and this not correct? Because it's a tenth as quick to be a learning opportunity. Are they but, like little tests? Like I'm just sorry, we're having some issues sort of practicing some other classes. So are they like, like well, a or they, they are, um, that, that's a fair question. They really gave specific instruction to a teacher, AP teachers, do not use these for assessments. Don't treat them as quizzes or tests because, you know, on an AP test, you know, if, if you get somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, uh, 65 or 70 out of 108 points, you rocked it. So, you know, if you're, if, if teachers are using those with the standard kind of 90, 80, 70, grading scale, you're going to get crushed and they don't want that. So what, what these are our uh, completion only grades. They will get graded by the program. So it'll tell you, you know, you got four out of five correct, or it'll tell you you got, you know, four wrong and six wrong out of those. But I will grade them only by completion. So if you do each one, you get 100% of that topic question grade, which is 5% of your overall grade. Uh -huh. But if you don't do them, then you get zero out of that. So mm -hmm. do, do them all. Yeah. And will these only be like curation just? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, I, what I'm doing, I think, I guess you, I think you could do them otherwise. I'm not sure. I, what I'm doing is trying to put that link on. Yeah. So I, I put the link on there. I mean, it's the same link over and over again. So like on Monday, you can click the link and go to AP Classroom and go to that quiz. Tuesday, you can click on that link. It's the same link, but I repeat it there each day. I'm just trying to make it convenient. Yeah. Is it the same place where you post like the videos and stuff? The link, it's in the modules, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, is that what you're asking? Yeah, it's in the modules, yeah. yeah. That's the module, the intent of the modules is the one-stop shop, right? You just go there. You see everything, you can access everything. So wait, you have one already that was yesterday? Yeah, uh, it was long ago. Friday. 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 Okay. But I reopened, I extended it till Friday this week. So if you didn't do that, Friday, you Friday. can now still go back and do that up until Friday. Okay, I see. See it now? Okay. Uh, your stuff, because I said it, I think, at the beginning of the year, but then we had nine weeks where we were on our walk where we weren't really doing calculus. Do it again. Because now I've done before. Yeah. Good thing this is stuff you've seen before. Mm -hmm. So we know that the, uh, so the slope of the tangent line we know is our f prime of x, which is the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So that's our definition of the derivative. So if we if we use these as x's, we get the derivative function. If we use that as a particular number, then what we get uh, is the derivative at that number. 
So we'll get A plus H, F of A plus H minus F of A all over H. That would be like to find the derivative at X equals three. We do F of three plus H minus F of three all over H. There's an alternative way of doing this too. So another way of getting F prime of A, and you have to be understand all the different ways of getting a derivative. It's going to be the limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a all over x minus a. So these are two different versions of the derivative at a point. Hopefully that's familiar. You remember how to do that. And uh, just so you know, so we have a curve, and we've got a normal line to the curve at a point. Or I'm sorry, a tangent line to a curve at a point. A normal line, so a normal line is perpendicular to the tangent line at that point of tangency. So what you get with a normal line is a line to that same point on the curve but it's perpendicular to the tangent line. And so I think in your homework you may see something that asks you to find an equation of a normal line. Well, I think the rest you hopefully will remember. I think I can talk about epsilon delta in the one minute we have left. So. I think we need to depart. <coughs> Yeah. I agree. That's the one in particular I was talking about the other day. Or something else. What's that? Oh, that's the one I was talking about last That's the one you were thinking about? Yeah. And um, we, can, we can talk about that. <laughs> it's not an AP topic, so the good news is. No. <laughs>